know, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11 today. Um, once again, it's a big chapter, a lot to say in here. But uh, we're going to be in verses 17 through 19. And you know, there's certain Bible stories that uh, really need no introduction. And when you think about this, um, there are so well known that even people who uh, don't go to church or uh, are outside the family of faith may uh, have never actually read the Bible, but they know these stories. Um, you know, think about Adam and Eve or, or Noah and the ark, Moses and the Red Sea, uh, Joshua and the, jo- the walls of Jericho, and um, even Dan- Daniel and the lions did, or David and Goliath. But while you're making that list, you need to understand that don't forget to add this one, Abraham and Isaac. Abraham and Isaac, father and a son. And, and Abraham was ready to do what God commanded. Now, no wonder the writer of Hebrews uh, focuses on this scene. And, uh, you know, it shows us aspects of Abraham's faith, his amazing faith, in the greatest trial that he would ever face. And, and uh, I want to read this, and then we're going to talk about it some more, but uh, we're going to camp out here. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 and following, God's Word says this. It says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son it was he to whom it was said in Isaac your descendants shall be called he considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead from which he also received him back as a type and so I want to talk about Abraham's test here Um, in verse 17 it says and when he was tested And so, uh, in Genesis chapter 22, going all the way back to the very beginning, we have these, this, uh, account of what happened that the writer of Hebrews is referring to. It's, uh, Genesis chapter 22, and it says in verse 1 and 2 there, it says, Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Those two verses tell us what is at stake here. It would have been enough for God to simply say, take your son, But he qualified that phrase in three different ways. He said, take your only son, not forgetting that Ishmael was also his son, but meaning that Isaac was the promised son, the one whom he had promised to him. And so he said, take your only son, and then Isaac, the son for whom Abraham and Sarah had waited for 25 years. They waited for this son, and he was finally there. And and he says, whom you love. And and these words were meant to reassure him that God knew what he was asking Abraham to do. The one whom you love. By saying this, Abraham would know that God, what it would cost him to obey God. Now, when God tells you something... (laughs) you have really one of two choices. You either obey or you don't obey. To stop and argue, that in itself is a form of disobedience. So really you have one choice and that is to obey when God tells you something. Let's be clear about what God was asking at this point. He wanted Abraham to travel with his son to Moriah, which is today called Jerusalem. And he wanted him to build an altar there made of stones on which to uh, offer a sacrifice. And he would make a platform out of wood, put that on top of the stones. And then he wanted him to take a knife and to sacrifice his son Isaac the same way a sacrificial lamb would have been slain. 
And finally, he would light the wood on fire to consume his son's body as an offering to God, allowing the the smoke to go up to heaven. And, And this is what God told Abraham to do. But he only had one or two options, either to obey or to not obey. And this was Abraham's test. But look at Abraham's trust. We read in Hebrews verse 11, chapter 11, verse 18, it says, and it was he to whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants will be, shall be called. See, the writer of Hebrews wants us to think about what was at stake. I mean, we naturally focus on the unimaginable sorrow of losing a child. To any parent, that alone would be an unspeakable tragedy. And nothing in all the world seems more unnatural than for parents to bury their children. It's out of place. And this is, in this case, God told Abraham to offer his only son. And Abraham was fully prepared to do it. So prepared, in fact, that in verse 17, actually says that Abraham offered Isaac. He offered Isaac as a sacrifice, meaning that he laid his son on the altar. He raised the knife. He fully intended to sacrifice his son to God. See, our minds focus on that aspect because it's so heartbreaking and so personal. But the writer wants us to think about something else. God had already promised to make Abraham the head of a great nation. The head of a great nation and a nation that would bring great blessing to all the nations of the world. And and I I love that because he talks about that in Genesis 12, uh, verses one through three. And, And God had said that he would bring forth a nation from Isaac's descendants, but that couldn't happen if Isaac was dead. I mean, at this point, Isaac was probably a teenager. Now, I I know that's a a trying time in life, but, but we are faced with what seems to be an enormous possibility. The fact that he's supposed to bless Abraham And all the nations would be blessed. It's supposed to come through Isaac, but God is asking him to sacrifice Isaac to himself. But listen, here's the salient point here. Faith believes and leaves the how in the hands of Almighty God. Faith believes and leaves the how in the hands of Almighty God. God commanded him to offer his son. And God promised to bring forth offspring through Isaac. See, the promise and the command seem to contradict each other. If Abraham obeys the command, does that mean that God would cancel the promise since Isaac would then be dead? If he disobeys the command, what happens to the promise? See, here is the stellar, amazing, beyond this world character of Abraham's faith. He didn't know how God would do it. He didn't know how God was going to do what he was what God was asking him to do. He just knew God would do it somehow. See, this is a lesson for us all. When God makes a promise, <laughs> When God makes a promise, it is foolishness and disbelief to wonder how he is going to keep his word. He has so much more power than we could possibly imagine. The things that are impossible for us are not impossible for God. With God, all things are possible. You see, faith does not calculate the how. Faith believes and leaves the how in the hands of Almighty God. If we spend too much time trying to figure out the how, God will take care of us, then we are likely to paint ourselves into a corner. 
And remember that Abraham had no idea, none, zip, zero, nada. He had no idea how God was going to do that when he and Isaac headed out on that three-day journey to Moriah. He had no idea. See, there are times in life, many times, when our only job is to take the next step. We believe, we trust him, and so we follow. We do what he tells us to do. We aren't called to figure out the big picture or to explain where it's going to lead. When God says go, we go. When God says stop, we stop. When God says, give me your dearest possession, we offer it to him. Folks, this is the life of faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. This is the life of faith. Notice here Abraham's triumph in verse 19. It says, he considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead from which he also received him back as a type. See, in this verse, we learn something that is only hinted at in Genesis 22. Twice in that chapter, Abraham suggests that he expects that somehow, some way, God was gonna work things out so that Isaac would live. And when he saw Moriah in the distance... He gave instructions, excuse me, instructions to his servants. He says this in verse 5 of Genesis 22. He says, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. Did you catch that? We will worship and return to you. Not I will come back, but we will come back. See, Abraham believed that he and his son would somehow return together. Then as the two of them are walking along, you know, Isaac's carrying the wood for the sacrifice, and he asks his father, he says, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Wanting to know, hey, I know what we're doing, uh, where's the lamb at? And Abraham's reply has become a synonym for the man of faith speaking faith into what is a humanly hopeless situation. He said this in verse 8. He said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. See, the writer of Hebrews tells us why Abraham could talk like that. Why he believed that? He believed that God could raise the dead. (laughs) Didn't know how. Never seen it happen before. But Abraham believed that he and his son would somehow return together. See, he reasoned from what he knew about God to what he knew about the situation. And the only thing he could come up with was that I'm going to put my own son to death and then God will raise him from the dead. Folks, that is pretty fantastic that Abraham would believe that, especially since no one in history had ever been raised from the dead at that point. This happened 2,000 years before Christ. See, God can raise the dead, a fact that was proved by the empty tomb outside the walls of Jerusalem. That part was 100% correct. But he was wrong about the fact that Isaac was dying that day because he wasn't dying that day. The angel of the Lord called out to Abraham from heaven and he told him not to kill his son. He had passed the test. Then Abraham seen a ram. He looks up and he sees this ram in the thicket. And, and, and he, he, the, the ram that God had placed there, he offered that ram in place of his son. So figuratively, he did receive his son back from the dead. But we can now stand back and see 
the story in clear perspective. Did God ask Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac? Yes, he did. He knew what God had asked him to do and he knew that God had promised to give him a son through whom the world would be blessed. What he didn't know was how God was going to do that. He didn't know how God was going to reconcile his promise on the one hand with his command on the other hand. But right here, in this moment, we see Abraham's faith in its highest and at its best. Even though the command made no sense from a human point of view, Abraham intended to obey it anyway. (laughs) With God, all things are possible. Abraham intended to obey it. His heart of faith meant to obey God's command, even though it meant killing God's promise. Maybe God had another plan. Maybe God was going to do something special, and he did. How could a person do such a thing? Because he believed that God could raise the dead. And for 2,000 years, Christians have seen this story as a picture of the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, in Genesis 22, (laughs) we see what a man would do for the love of God. Because of his love for God. But at the cross, we see what God would do for the love of God. Of man. See, Abraham was only asked to sacrifice Isaac, but God actually sacrificed his own son. Jesus endured that, that horrible death, that physical death, and the separation from God to obtain redemption for sinners. Jesus died on that cross. For you and for me. Jesus died on the cross for you and for me. Now what are we supposed to take away from the account of Abraham and Isaac? You know, when I read Genesis 22, I was struck by something that God said to Abraham. After the great trial was over, the ram had been sacrificed, Isaac spared, and the promise reaffirmed. God commends Abraham by saying this in verse 12 of Genesis 22. He said, "Now, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And then in verse 16 he said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, Indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. God said, give me your most prized possession, your most precious possession, and you gave it to me. I asked you for it, and you gave it to me. Now, seen in that light, this test is easy to explain, but it takes a lifetime to learn. I mean, God leads most of us up and down, up and down to Mount Moriah many times. We are asked to sacrifice our dearest and our best in life. But listen, an idol is anything good that becomes too important to you. Anything good that becomes too important to you. In one of his books, Watchman Nee, he said that we approach God like little children with open hands begging for gifts. 
Asking God to give us these things because he is a good God. He blesses, he fills our hands with good things. He gives us life, he gives us health, he gives us friends, he gives us money, he gives us success, he gives us recognition, he gives us uh, challenges, he gives us marriage, he gives us children, he gives us a nice home, he gives us a good job. All of the things that we count when we count our blessings. And so like little children, we rejoice in what we have and what we've received and we run around comparing what we have with each other. Oh, what'd you get? What'd you get? Why'd you, I, look what I got. Oh, you got that? Oh, I didn't get that. What did you get? And we compare it to one another. And when our hands are finally full, God says, my child, I love to have, I'd love to have fellowship with you. Here, take my hand. And we say, I can't, Lord, my hands are full of all the stuff you've given me, all of those blessings, but we can't do it because our hands are full. And he says, but I am the one who gave them to you in the first place. See, God made me face this this truth many years ago when I came to the realization that whatever I held on to too tightly, it was subject to being broken. I wrote a sermon once called The Blessing of Brokenness. And the words were true and they cut deep. And it was a very tough lesson to learn. And the problem is this, is that we love our idols. You know, in one of her books, Elizabeth Elliot, she makes the point that the process of Christian growth is how God breaks the idols of our life one by one by one. It's so painful because by definition, we love our idols. We protect them because they give us strength, they give us hope, they give us meaning. But here's the tricky part. Most of our idols are really good things. The thing that I was holding on to so tightly, it wasn't bad, it wasn't evil, it wasn't wrong. It was something good that had become too important to me. See, an idol is anything good that becomes too important to you. And we tend to associate idols with, you know, heathen statues uh, made of gold or silver or bronze or wood. And, and, and if, if, if that's all an idol is, then, you know, We're in the clear because we don't bow down to those weird statues and offer pig blood and chicken feet and other things. But why would we do something like that? But listen, an idol can be anything good. Our children, for example. Many parents idolize their children. Our fame our athletic ability, our reputation, oh, I'm just getting started, our money, our home, our position, our education, our cars, our, our, our people, uh, people that we know, the, the degrees that we've earned, the money that we've made, the deals that we've closed, the, the classes that we've taught, all of these things that we view as a badge of honor can become an idol. Friends that we've cultivated in high places, buildings we've built, organizations we've managed, budgets that we've balanced, the books we wrote, the songs we sang, the records we made, the trips we took, the portfolios that we built, all of these things make us feel comfortable and safe and gives us status in the world. Could your family be an idol? Definitely. Your children be an idol? Yes. Could your career be an idol? Yes. Could your ministry be an idol? Absolutely. Anything good can become an idol. See, that's the real challenge of this story. Abraham had to come to the place where he willingly gave back to God what was always God's in the first place. 
See, we hang on to stuff and things so tightly, but as the wise man said, your arms are too short to box with God. You know, when speaking on this topic, I I always wish to press this point. Hold lightly what you value greatly because it doesn't belong to you anyway. Hold lightly what you value greatly because it doesn't belong to you anyway. We come into this life with nothing and we leave this life with nothing. And in between, God fills our hands with good things. And then he asks us to give them back to him so that we can walk in fellowship with him. And it's a very painful process. I've found in my life when I'm talking with people that the process of letting go is the work of a lifetime. For most of us, there can't simply be one crisis moment but rather it's a continual letting go. It's a lesson we all have to learn over and over and over again. And God, in his kindness, keeps bringing us back to Mount Moriah, back to the place of sacrifice, back to the place where we offer to God our dearest and our best and say, Lord, it all belongs to you. You see, God's goodness, his kindness is in display in this count. It's the kindness of God that led Abraham to Mount Moriah. It's the kindness of God that leads us back to the place of sacrifice where we yield up to him our dreams, our hopes, our desires, our plans, the things we own, our dearest friends, our loved ones, and finally we give back to him the very life that he gave us in the beginning. See, when we're struggling with God, And trying so desperately to hold on to those things we value so much. It may not feel like God's kindness. But it is. It totally is. He knows better than we do that as long as we hold on, good things become idols to us. And he comes, it comes between us and, and, and God's love. And he loves us so very, very much and he wants the best for us. And when we finally have the courage to let go, when we stop trying to desperately hold on, when we open our hands to God, when we hold lightly what we value greatly, when we give back to God what has always been His anyway, then and only then are we truly free. See, the yielding up is often very painful and we don't feel good about it. And sometimes we don't feel good even when it's all over. But free is the right word. Then and only then are we truly free. How wonderful for us to enter into that liberty of saying, Lord, I have no idea how all of this is going to work out. All I know is all of this belongs to you. Do with it as you will. And the Lord says, bring your dearest and bring your best to the altar and leave it all in my hands. See, through all of this, our Heavenly Father leads us along the pathway towards complete trust in him and slowly we begin to discover that the things we thought that we couldn't live without don't matter as much as we thought they did even the dearest and sweetest things of life take second place to the pleasure of knowing God and in the end we discover that he's emptied our hands of everything and then filled them with himself. See, I admit that even as I speak these words, 
I personally don't have this all fully dialed in. I'm almost done. Last Wednesday evening, two tornadoes hit Temple. During church time on Wednesday night, I want to tell you, it was such a precious time to be here. We had, we had about, I don't know, 45, 50 kids, young people, youth, babies, older folks in the parlor. We began at 6. The storm hit at 6.30. Everybody came into the parlor. We began singing praise hymns led by Corey Jumper playing his guitar leading us in some songs of praise you know what was not in that room fear you know what was not in that room anxiety we were praising the Lord in the midst of the storm none of those children even knew what was going on outside and I told him I said God tells us over and over in his word, fear not, fear not. And when we are afraid, we take it to him in prayer. That room was filled with peace. That room was was filled with mercy and grace. And you know what? It was so amazing. I just felt like we were in that room and God had his hand over us. Oh, and the storm was raging. Believe me, when hail hits this building, this metal roof, it echoes loud in this chamber. But the thing is, is while this was all going on, we were praising God. It was amazing. It was so amazing. Even with the events of this last month, we're all learning to take nothing for granted because there are no guarantees about the future. And we are learning to keep an open hand, holding lightly those things that we value greatly because it all belongs to God anyway. And we celebrate God's kindness and his goodness to us. I'm thankful that there weren't lives lost in temple as this storm was going on because in the aftermath you can look around you can say man how did anybody survive some of this but what a blessing even in the midst his kindness and goodness to us I'm going to invite our worship team to come back up here and we're going to continue to worship and you know some of you are in the midst of a great struggle in your life right now you feel pressured about things and you don't want to give it up But I want to say this as a word of encouragement. You must give it up. You must. And you will. It was Christ himself who said this in Mark 8 verse 36. For what does it benefit a person to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Maybe that's our real problem. Maybe we've gained so much that we don't dare let go. Otherwise, we lose our whole world. And somewhere in the process, we've lost our own soul. So I ask you this morning, what is your Isaac What is it that you need to lay on the altar before God? Are you willing to lay it down for the sake of Christ, for Jesus' sake? See, I'm, I'm looking for willing hearts. I know that's what God's looking for. Are you willing to be willing to lay it down? Because sometimes we're just hanging on to it for all we're worth. Maybe we need to give it to God and let him take it. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for how it challenges us.